Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric, and with me on Double Feature is Michael Kester. Oh, hi. Yeah, it's really nice to be here today. Uh, Michael Kester, we have a couple <laughs> movies that are going to be on this show. We do. Now, let me tell you, um, it's hard to move away from horror films. It is. But uh, we got a lot of them last time, and I think this time we're going to do, I don't know, let's call them science fiction films. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I don't feel a lot different when I'm watching a science fiction film than a horror film. No, I don't either. Because uh, normally science fiction 80s, is horrifying. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, so we have the 1988 version mm-hmm. of The Blob. Um, we're doing a little uh, kind of some of my favorite sci-fi, some of your favorite sci-fi. Yeah, that's more so or less if I it. So if I could claim rights, if I could plant my proverbial flag in The Blob, okay. what would you say uh, your half of this feature is? I'm going to have to uh, say that uh, my claim lands on Mars Attacks. Yeah, I didn't give you a lot of choices there. Cause it's okay. I, I think that would have been the one I chose. Oh, okay, <laughs> right. So yeah, the 88 version of The Blob, not the earlier one. Right. And, and not the, the later one. The only version. Not of, the Rob Zombie version. The non-existent Rob Zombie version of The Blob. Right. Yeah, that's um that's one of those things that just disappears into the ether eventually, right? No one will know that Rob Zombie was once slated to direct a remake of yeah, The Blob. Yeah, we can all... Uh... Rest easy. Now, I've been keeping a secret from you yeah, as well. You, you keep a lot of secrets from me on the show. Uh, sometimes a, I don't even know what films we're doing until you hit record. Well, it's funnier if I tell you on the show is the yeah. reason for that. But I just found this out a couple minutes ago. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to pretend to have known all about this. This was another happy accident. This is a Cronenberg cinematographer double feature. Really? Yeah, it is. Uh, I'm not going to say much about that right now. We'll get into it as people are using the chapters and skipping the spoilers. Wow, okay. Use the chapters if you'd like to skip the spoilers. So if you've never heard double feature before, which is, I assume, everybody who listens, mm-hmm. uh, we spoil both of the movies. Yeah, we do. As it's much one of our fortes. You you spoil the blob and Mars Attacks. Yeah, it's one of the few things we're good at. I don't even know if that's true. Half the time, I think <laughs> we usually spoil blow it. <laughs> <laughs> we usually blow the spoilers. Well, we get to the end of the movie, and then it's just sort of yeah, and the movie ended. And uh, well, let's talk about the we next always, movie. We always we talk about the films, and we give the audience, our audience, Podmanity, a lot of credit for having watched them. Yeah. So we end up not spoiling it. I think in our head we're spoiling it by by asking them to watch the film. I just get excited for the next chapter. To be yeah, totally honest with you, yeah, that's true. We're gonna get to the end of the blob, and I'm gonna say something like oh blah blah, and then this happens or something, and Mars attacks. Yeah. And then I'm gonna be really sad about Mars attacks until I realize we have two more films we could do yeah, next time on the show exactly so uh if you just want to hear the exciting parts you can use the chapters feature to skip right to the first 12 seconds of uh each segment each chapter of the show today let's start with the blob all right so before we talk about the cinematographer thing i want to talk about chuck russell all right well we have to make this first 12 seconds really exciting oh my god chuck russell chuck russell my Fuck. fucking god well we have enough vulgarity i think so we at least cover that portion yeah jesus Goddamn. Um, Chuck Russell's the writer director of this uh, here remake of the blob. I you know I don't even want to call it a remake. I don't think it's, it's a, just it's just another movie. It's Chuck Russell's it's the, blob. the blob. Yeah, we've really been hitting the writer directors this year. Always good to it's see. The way those. to do it, man. It's the way to. It's the way films I think come out the best because if you hate them. There's a it's really clear guy. reason. Fuck that guy. And if you like them, there's a really clear reason. You don't have to get into the... There's no ambiguity. Yeah, you don't have to get into the weird mixology of, well, I kind of like the cinematography and the screenplay, but sure. I think the plot and the camera direction was right. a little weak. <laughs> right. That's We don't do that on the show. It's easier for us to just come in and go, that guy fucked up. You don't get into that uh, Tron Legacy thing where there's 100,000 animators, so yeah. you're not sure who to pat on the back for, hey, good job on the way that movie looks. Yeah, exactly. Chuck Russell was also the writer-director on the third Nightmare on Elm Street movie. Which would be Dream Warriors? Yeah, the one that everybody loves. Yeah. That's uh, definitely... Definitely, I think when you look back at the Nightmare films, the one everybody goes, oh, that's, I have an hour and a half to kill. I'm going to watch that one. Well, I think that's the second one. I think the first one you choose is the one where someone's blood gets splattered all over the ceiling. <laughs> sure. Followed by, I can walk when I was once in a wheelchair. Well, I would start with the first one and then somehow convince myself I have time for the rest of the franchise. They all have great graphics. Oh, Nightmare on Elm Street. I miss you terribly. 
Other films with great graphics include The Blob. <laughs> right. Right. Well, you know, you have uh, a mixture of uh, practical effects and great graphics. You do. Right? So you have that kind of signature Chuck Russell, um, who also directed an episode of Fringe, by the way. Yeah, and Fringe is head, great. Everybody watch Fringe. Don't watch Lost. It's the, uh, it's the I want to say like the sixth, seventh episode of the third season. When they're in, I can't spoil Fringe. Can't when spoil. all that crazy stuff is you happening. You literally can't. It's almost impossible <laughs> it's, to spoil Fringe. It's impossible. But I, I imagine Chuck Russell's episode being the one with blue light pouring out in beams from behind sure. a forest tree full of fog. Uh-huh. That's just I that look from the 80s where everything had a ton of fucking fog in it. Yeah, including the intro titles. I was going to say, except for the John Carpenter film, The Fog, which right. had... Back when we did The Fog on the show, I, I believe I complained that there wasn't enough fog yeah. on the film The Fog. That's the uh, that's the kind of astute observations you get here on Double Feature. <laughs> so this is why we have all new listenership every episode on the show. The cinematographer on this one is Mark Irwin. Mark Irwin. So Irwin did Scanners, Videodrome, The Fly. He did a lot of that earlier Cronenberg mm-hmm. stuff. In my head, I go, oh, three of my favorite Cronenberg movies, sure. but I love all the Cronenberg yeah. movies. Oh, my God. We're going to get to the Mars Attacks portion, and I'm going to think, oh, all my favorite Cronenberg movies. So let's completely switch topics then. I want to talk about wiping out on your bike in front of a homeless man. Oh, man. The single most humiliating it's thing really, I was just thinking that can that. happen to a person. It's uh, really fucking embarrassing. But so this is so this is some of that fun Chuck Russell stuff I want to talk about. And I love me some Chuck Russell. Yeah. You know, he's done, uh, as we'll see with all the cinematographers on the show today, and uh, later in Chuck Russell's career, more modern movies, perhaps of a more questionable variety. <laughs> but, you know, even he had that period in the 90s when he was doing stuff like Eraser, that Schwarzenegger film right, that yeah. gets a lot of attention. He does a lot of stuff with neon titles. Did Eraser have a neon yeah, title? Yeah, it was green. I don't remember that at all. Pay attention. Oh, and there was a refrigerator. This is not the Eraser episode of the podcast. Yet. We'll get to that next week. Eraser and Eraser head next week. No, but what I was getting at is uh, Chuck Russell juxtaposes this guy falling off his bike in front of a homeless man. Really, the the only purpose of this, I think, is so that we feel terrible for this poor yeah. little rebel. Well, also, it it's the uh, it's the beginning of... The, uh, the hamster jump. You need to set up your hamster jump for later oh, on right? the film. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So maybe there's a couple purposes it's serving. I just go through this whole movie thinking, God, that poor kid. Yeah. Everybody is just fucking picking on him. It's true. He really gets a bad rap. And I, he does. I, you never see him do anything wrong. Maybe no. drink underage, right? Sure. Well, he's um, being a rebellious teenager. But he doesn't do anything really wrong. However, the cop is so sure he's going to end up in prison sure. within the next few months. Well, he's got a shady past. Yeah, and the town seems to feel the same way. A kid ends up mutilated <laughs> sure. and uh, they immediately go to that rambunctious youth probably slaughtered and mutilated that kid yeah. previously yeah, right. previously underage drinking yeah but now that he's over 18 and juvie's out of the question he is a fucking maniac well it says a lot about that small town yeah it says a lot about you know running into the the drugstore clerk in, yeah. uh <laughs> you know when you go to pick up your girlfriend for a date I was seeing a girl briefly, long story that the blob ruined the punchline too, oh. but it was in a small town and that shit happened all the time. We would run into her ex-boyfriend all over the fucking place. Well, there's only 20 people in the town. Those right. people have to have jobs. Yeah. And if you're going to leave your house, you have to go to those places Sure, and you just fucking run into them everywhere. So this kid, uh, another result of being in a small town, if he's the only rebellious kid, it doesn't really matter what his past crimes are. He's the usual suspects, right? Yeah. I mean, if someone much. winds up mutilated, well, sure. who's it going to be? It's clearly not that preacher. He's a man of God. So uh, it must be the guy who was in juvie. Yeah, it's not Letterman Jacket. It's not uh, It's not Amanda or, sorry, Shawnee Smith. I get those names mixed up all the time. I, um, I imagine that in the prison system, it's basically just one cell where they occasionally lock up that kid. Yeah, sure. It's like the Andy Griffith show where Otis comes in drunk and he just kind of has a room. It's almost like where he stays. I was going to say it's like Cemetery Junction, but we can go with that instead. Oh yeah, yours is better. So he wipes out on his bike in front of this homeless guy and Chuck Russell decides to juxtapose that with the crowd cheering yeah. in the beginning. Yeah. I think all of the best 80s films start with some kind of cheerleading montage yeah, mashup. Ah, it's just where you want to be in the 80s. 
I recently, you're going to probably scoff at me because you listen to actual music, <laughs> but uh, I'm listening to some music that the kids listen to these days. Oh, no. And as you know, I get incredibly excited oh, anytime no. I, uh, yeah. Before I find... you tell me who it is, I just want to come right out and say I don't like any of the music the kids are <laughs> listening to these days. Um, have you heard Sleigh Bells? No. Okay, so this might not be terribly bad. Sleigh Bells is, uh, no one cares about any of this. I'm going to keep it on the show anyways. Sleigh Bells is this kind of electronic-y thing. Okay. But it's um, it's this dude and this chick, and the girl sings in a very kind of peppy sort of pop style, but the music is this, it's it's meaner than it needs to be. Okay. <laughs> it's just this incredibly bassy, aggressive, it just feel and the album cover is some kind of like 80s cheerleader pyramid. Okay. It's just wonderful, and it makes me want to make an 80s throwback film, so I listen to it all. It's the happiest thing I yeah. listen to. Well, when we get to Mars Attacks, I'll talk about the record that I just recently bought when we're talking about Annette Benning. Ooh, exciting. So you get that juxtaposition of the, the crowd cheering there. But Chuck returns back to that kind of idea when you have the uh, the blob attacking the, the AC guy, the movie theater yeah. guy who comes to check on the, it. Yeah, uh, hot dog guy from The Happening. Well, yeah, right after that. And it, it comes down from the ceiling or whatever. And then the crowd, it cuts to that crowd reaction the of scream. the movie. What's yeah. the name of that movie? It's uh, like Garden, Garden Till. Tail Massacre. I think it's Garden Till Massacre. Garden Till Massacre. I'm not sure what a Garden Tail is. I don't know. It's, it's a tale from the garden. But it's probably different. Than, I'm going to take you to task on the name of the fake movie within the 1988 version of The Blob yeah, right now. What else is new? Let me tell you a little bit about Garden Till Massacre. It's, it's your, your basic uh, your slice, basic and, slice dice. and dice. Oh, great. A killer with a hockey mask. Yeah. This movie's just teasing Slicing us. Slicing up teenagers. From the guy who made the Nightmare films, it's kind of weird to Yeah, well, I think that's probably a jab. Hockey mask, chops up teenagers. My favorite part, though, yeah. is <laughs> don't worry, there's no sex or anything in it. There's no oh, sex well, or anything bad, oh, I believe, God. was the line. It's perfect. And this isn't just one of those things, oh, they're from a small town. Right. You know, this is, uh, especially in the 80s, that was the height of... Man, we always go back to uh, Silent Night, Deadly Night. Mm -hmm. But the that's what I think of when I think, let's have a silly, worthless protest of slasher sure. films. I think Silent Night, Deadly Night is really about as serious as anyone ever deserved to, to take any of that shit. Probably far more serious. Absolutely. But as we look back on it now and mock it, that's as serious as it should be taken. They do come from that. That's what it is, though. It's a skiing town. That's yeah. how you know it's a, this is Lumberton, right? Uh -huh. It's a small town and... The big busy season, the tourist season, is when it snows and people ski, yep. I guess. The reason The Blob is honestly one of my favorite science fiction films, especially one of my favorite 80s sci-fi films, and that feels so awful after we just mentioned The Fly. Is it because it's gross? It's fucking gross. Yeah. <laughs> it's bloody and it's gross, and this is the closest I get to your brand of sort of Peter Jackson vomit yeah, stuff. Yeah. Because it, it all has that same kind of nasty fluidity. Yeah. It's it's, it's bloody. It's hyper gore. It's yeah. a it's a it's taking gore to this level that not it's not like what we were talking about last week. It's taking gore to this level where it's so extreme that it's beyond reality. It's the unnecessary aggression yeah. from sleigh bells. That's yeah, what it sure. is. It's, it just doesn't need to be there. Like, like, come on, that's a little mean. You don't need to see a guy get his head sucked into a drain. Sure. But, <laughs> but you it's there. really, deep down, love when it happens. Oh, you so do. And it doesn't, you can disconnect yourself in a way that makes it more fun and horrific yeah, than yeah. just plain horrific. Yeah, poor It's George probably because it's purple, goodness. right? It's it's purple goo or pink It's kind of pink. It's yeah. bubble gum. Yeah. You're, it's people getting eaten by bubble gum. <laughs> sure. At the end of the day, it's the old Goosebumps book, The Blob That Ate Everyone. Yeah, right. And it's Is just, that what that was called? The Blob yeah. That Ate Everyone? And it's just it's just gum eating people. Well, so this gets to my, my deep down uh, secret. I mean, I can come on here and just say that oh i love the blob and sure. it's one of my favorite and no whatever, one will blah, blah, blah. no one will no one will question it yeah. but of all of my favorite villains in cinema history i've never told you this but the blob is one of my favorite yeah and i have no explanation for why that is it's weird because it has no personality to it sure from listening to the show and from doing the show with me i mean you and i talk about these villains these great cinema villains sure. all the time yeah that's really one of our that's one of our uh, staples it is i mean we like these complicated characters we like villains where they're not you know static they're these uh intricate sort of characters maybe they're good men making bad decisions sure. or vice versa 
or they're put in a tough spot sure. or you it's know like the they science would, of evil really they, <laughs> well like they would have us believe the hazmat team is yeah right yeah that oh they just have to make a rough decision but they're mm-hmm. also twirling their mustache at the the blob isn't any of that it has no deep character traits i like no complexity it's just it's fucking faceless and go figure you love jason as well yeah yeah isn't that strange it's unknown, and you know, I think the thing I like about it is how relentless it mm-hmm. is, how uh, it just keeps growing, and it's the other direction from that, you know, that villain, that complicated antagonist. Sure. Instead of a real man with a real past who is making real decisions for whatever reasons, and that being interesting, we have a faceless chemical that is just roaming around the street causing scenes that I like. Right. And it doesn't, you don't need to examine it. You don't need to figure out how or why it right. gets in yep. places because it's a gelatinous blob. Yeah. Right. That's how it gets there. Yeah. Sure. And what it does is kill people. Yeah. The rest is unnecessary. Man, that fucking George getting sucked into the sink, though, is <laughs> really, it's kind of reminiscent of Sleepaway Camp, which yeah. I think uh, after having seen Sleepaway Camp since the last time I saw the blob. It gives me the sort of renewed satisfaction yeah. about that. But the bloody feet and the the sink, you know, splitting open on the bottom and just the, the blood coming out. It's so perfect already. And then there's that pull away shot of just spewing up yeah. to the ceiling, which you can do with the blob. <laughs> Things are just always spewing sure. everywhere. It's either bloody or it's invoking blood through other visual imagery. Yep. And how do you not love that about it? But then you always underestimate it because it's a fucking blob. You hear the movie The Blob, and that can't be bloody or gross or disgusting. It's going to be silly. Yeah, it's going to be sticky, and it's going to be goofy. (laughs) Yeah. And then the movie starts, and, you know, it's not too far in before you're running in, oh, my God, Doctor, a man is dying, and that is his fucking body is half melted, and you remember that The Blob is fucking brutal. And immediately following that is one of the things that really makes the blobs as a film stand out to me. Mm. You have these three initial characters. Sure. You have Kevin Dillon, mm-hmm. the uh the actor from Entourage, yeah, yeah. who plays the outlaw, kind of the kid who you expect to just be looking out for himself, be a total dick He's the to loner, everyone. Right? Sure. Yeah. And then Shawnee Smith, who we talked about at length last week, mm. and she's the goody two shoes cheerleader and then her boyfriend who is the upstanding, heroic football player. The town loves him. He yeah, is right. clearly the protagonist. Sure. In 15 minutes, his <laughs> face melts. I know. Well, yeah, his face melts, and it's awful. Yeah, it's and terrifying. you see this kid it's who great. you're expecting, he's going to take charge. Yeah. He's going to be the hero of the town, and he dies. His arm gets ripped oh, off. Oh, God, fucking arm. Me- the thing is the melting, yeah. right? The arm melting off and the face melting and making that warped, scary Tarantino face from Planet face. Terror face. Well, Planet Terror got them. It, that's melting member, right? I mean, like Planet Terror really got the melting things. Just fucking melt all the things. One of my favorites is when the girl falls on the theater floor uh, towards the later section of the movie. When we were talking about them watching the, the Garden Till sure. Massacre thing. And you forget about all the melting until they go to pick up her body. It's been, a, you know, it's been a good handful of scenes since we got any melting people. And it's just on the theater floor and sticky and bloody. And yeah. her, her whole, that half of her body has turned into taffy. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. It's not all melting. There's other uh, effect shots of, you know, when they're on fucking makeout hill or whatever. Yeah. And the girl's face just turns into a turns into a halloween mask basically kind of, it implodes it just yeah it's really bizarre to yeah, see it's happen. nasty it's nasty oh my god it's That'd beautiful great but then there's stuff you can only do with a gelatinous villain yeah uh like the phone booth scene yeah. you know being stuck in the phone booth and it just being claustrophobic and suffocating and this is okay so i'm gonna outline right now why i shouldn't have a show on the internet when you think infamous you know horror scene with a phone booth, you think the birds. That's what you're supposed to think. You're really? supposed to think, oh, the scary. I'm informing you because you also shouldn't have a show on the internet. Neither okay, of us good, should be on the I internet. Don't, I don't think the We're birds not even at allowed all. to make YouTube comments. At the, that's, no, that's I think not my true. go to phone booth scene is The Matrix. You know what I mean. A scary. I know. Have you I'm seen just the birds? explaining my part. I have, and it, it was stupid. Well, there's a bunch of birds attacking somebody. It's In one of the booth. Hitchcock movies we have not displayed on Double Feature. Huh. But people are going to think that's the classic horror moment. Sure. The birds and the booth and phone booth. The birds and, and the booth, right. 
does not hold a candle to the phone booth in the blob. I always think the phone booth in the blob. She runs in and it's just, it's suffocating. It surrounds her and it, oh, so much better. I suppose that's the exact, you know, this might be some homage to the birds and maybe, maybe we owe something to Hitchcock for, no, fuck it. I just really we like the We don't owe blob. anything to anybody. I love the blob covering the phone booth. I love it. I love everything about it. You love that it's Papa Corn at the end of the movie. Yeah. I, well, it expands. That's the great part, I love part, my right? Papa Corn. I love one of my favorite. What was the scene you were you were uh, talking about when that came up? It was the scene where, at the end where the blob comes out of the ground and it's sure. grabbing the people and it slaps the, it squishes the guy against the sidewalk. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, I mean, Papa Corn is, we, we called, we, I don't even remember why. I think it was the third It was the of third. The it was Urban right? Harvest. Uh, here's the reason why. We were fucking delirious. Yeah. That's why. We were watching 13 Children of the Corn. I don't remember. But one of my why. favorite horrible special effects Uh and it's one that no one uses anymore because it was just such a stupid idea (laughs) is when you film something then you project that on a screen and then film a thing in front of the screen (laughs) that you so you're filming the same thing twice practical practical effects in the 70s and 80s they realized that you can rear project onto the screen and then act in front of it sure that which is what they did in this they have the clay bubblegum blob oh, moving in front I didn't of even notice. scary people Great. but it's it's a rear projected screen of the people running around see in the 60s in the kaiju movies mm. they did front projection so you would see <laughs> spears being thrown at the giant octopus sure, say sure but you would also see the shadow of the spear oh, going sad. toward the screen sad time hitting the uh the front projection so at least we've got rear projection with the uh the pop of corn and the little fake model people that he's eating. Ah, uh, technology. So, of course, if we talk about the blob, we have to talk about what does it all mean? Where did it come from? <laughs> because otherwise, that second half of the movie you always forget about where there's a bunch of people running around in hazmat suits. They're going to be really sad we didn't include them. Mm-hmm. I love this method of doing exposition. So this is another one. We're always talking about, hey, how do you get your exposition sure. in here? This is where you eavesdrop on the right. exposition. And it's a way of getting around the eye roll. I mean, it's your fault. Mm -hmm. You're listening in on somebody else. This is just two characters having a private conversation about where the blob came from. And, uh, you know, they're not trying to explain it to you or give you a bunch of heavy handed. But you know what? You show up and you're behind a bush and you're listening in. Yeah. And it's your fucking fault for having to hear this scene worth of exposition. My feeling for exposition, I know I bring this up on the show all the time, but if it's not obvious and you can't draw the conclusions based on what people are doing (laughs) and what people are saying when it's just inference, Mm -hmm. it doesn't need to be in the movie. Yeah, right. That's my personal opinion. You don't need to come up with a clever way to expose through dialogue or a sign wow you mean that no one would have asked where did the blob come from nobody would have given a shit well here's the the blob came from here's the thing though is you have to get to the part at the end with the evil hazmat team you don't it has to be a government-run experiment and you have to know that they're evil (laughs) who just say it has to this is absolutely this is necessary this well it's necessary for two reasons one you have to suddenly put a face on your antagonist that's true because you've been fighting a blob this whole time. Come on now. And uh, two, we need a precedent for movie history to have an evil hazmat team. And um, I'm curious. This is another great. Uh, this is why we have a show on the internet. Mm-hmm. So we can ask this. Double feature show at gmail.com if you have a better previous precedent. But I always think of this as a landmark for the evil hazmat team that has to do it for the greater good. Yeah. I always think of the blob. It's, um, you know, it's the scene, close the manhole, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll just have to leave those civilians. You don't Bill Mosley is expendable. Oh, I feel bad. <laughs> Later, we would see this in Outbreak. We'd see it, uh, you know, Resident Evil. Sure. Uh, we saw it on the show in REC. Yeah. You know, we've seen it sure. on the show in, in a lot of different ways. Cloverfield had a take on it. It had a hazmat team, although mm-hmm. they were doing something different there. Just because it seems like, okay, we're dealing with some sort of biology, something we just got to bring in a hazmat team. But they're not the last villain we see in this movie. There's also the crazy religious, not necessary ending. Yeah. And uh, a lot of times you get an ending like this and it's a setup for a sequel. And the fact that it's never capitalized on, whether the intention is to make a sequel or not, sometimes it feels like a heavy, oh, we're going to make a sequel. Now we have an opportunity. But this just kind of feels like another way to say, oh, you're fucked. 
This yeah. was only one incident of yeah. the blob. The blob's going to come sure. over time and time again. It. I don't you actually... You can't win. It's, yeah, it's, you can't win. Precisely. I don't actually want to see the blob too. I just want to know that somewhere there is going to be a crazy... And the fact it's a religious dude just sure. makes it even better. That he's got a, a fucking, scarred religious a, dude. Yeah, right? In a tent. Yeah. That's really the best kind. Sure. <laughs> That's absolutely the best kind. It just It's invoking Carnival again. It's That's been a while since we, since we did that. But yeah, we need a, a circus fucking sideshow, which is different than a... Fucking circus sideshow? Yeah, let's go with that. Anyways, I just like to think about it, and that's all, and that makes it the perfect ending for me. Which brings us to, uh, what's the name of that movie? Oh, it's called Mars Attacks, Yeah, and yeah, it it's is. probably the best handled Martian invasion film of the 90s. Well, I know you want to hear all about this other Cronenberg thing, so you can finally figure out what the hell I was talking about. Yeah, I actually, I am really interested to hear about this. Well, so this is kind of weird that these movies came together this way. So the blob was Mark Irwin. Sure, Mark Irwin. Mars Attacks. Now, after uh, Cronenberg and Mark Irwin separated, I mean, mm-hmm. he was using Irwin on a lot of his stuff. That's when Peter came in. You're going to have to help me with this last name. It's S-U-S-C-H-I-T-Z-K-Y, if you want to look that up. Do yourself a favor and just Google Peter Cronenberg, yeah. cinematographer. I believe it's pronounced Sashitsky. There you go. That's the only time we'll say it. But he did uh, all of Cronenberg stuff, really, Everything. after Mark Irwin. Oh, okay. Well, you know, from that period around, um, you know, we're talking Naked Lunch and oh, Crash Naked Lunch. and A History of Violence and Eastern Promises. Yeah, so he's involved in a lot of that stuff, and you get to see his handiwork in <laughs> Mars Attacks. Oh, yeah. These are both, uh, we could also say, films that maybe the cinematographer doesn't want us to drag yeah. out. But you know what? I don't even know if that's true, because again, if you look at the other uh, I Need a Paycheck movie, that these <laughs> cinematographers are strange like that. Maybe a reason we don't talk about them a lot on the show is their body of work is always so mixed. Yeah. You know, this guy did the fucking Empire Strikes Back, right? He was the director of photography or whatever sure. on it. But he also has a bunch of dubious stuff from the last <laughs> 20 years that I'll just, you know what? I'll let people find that on their own right. and amuse themselves. But it's also the return of Mr. Danny Elfman. It is. It's the triumphant return. The score in Mars Attacks. So Tim Burton and Danny Elfman, they have an innumerable amount of memorable scores. Beetlejuice, Certainly. Edward Scissorhands, Nightmare Before Christmas, Batman, Batman Returns, all of these oh, yeah. scores and themes that Danny Elfman has done for Tim Burton are probably some of the most iconic, barring The Simpsons. You know, as you uh, as you said each one of those scores, I wanted to interject, that's my favorite sure. one. Well, and don't forget Pee Wee. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, the score, oh, so many of those movies owed to their scores, too. I mean, Nightmare Before Christmas, yeah. obviously, sure. being a, a musical film. Sure. But then Edward Scissorhands. I yeah, mean, you have Ice Dance. A, Ice Dance is the one, right? God damn it. We've mentioned that probably on every Burton yeah. show, I think. But uh, then the Batman stuff. I yeah. mean, really every goddamn piece of it. And then you come back with Mars Attacks. I think Mars Attacks is one of the most unsung Danny Elfman themes. Yeah, right. Because you're tasked with a very difficult thing and i I mean we came to the conclusion that danny elfman is who you get for this sure sure but you need to come up with a score and then pull in the guitarist from one go boingo because you're not just bringing enough boingo back for your uh your score (laughs) i guess you come in to this film and you need to figure out how to terrify people because earth is under attack by legions of literal little green men Uh uh-huh but it also has to seem kind of funny yeah it also has (laughs) to be you have to be terrified but you have to laugh your way to the fucking morgue. A terrifying right? giggle fit. Yeah. You have, you have. I mean, it's not really a theremin. It's not the stupid, your sure. hands are levitating over magnetic bars. Right. It's a theremin sample on a synthesizer sure. over these flourishing and diminishing string things and, yeah. and, you know, your standard orchestra. And it's so fucking cool to see yeah. it with these V, the vanguards of alien warships sure, sure. headed toward earth yeah oh my god and and that's only following flaming cow parade well so. it's one of those things elfman's great at um you know his instrumentation often has a lot of character to it sure you know when you think back to the early stuff you know beetlejuice was a lot of those uh, instruments you hit with mallets yeah you know what i mean and then uh when you get to edward scissorhands it's a lot of kind of that coral bell. and well and the coral yeah. stuff too definitely yeah definitely 
you get a very distinct, I mean, there was kind of an era of Elfman stuff in there. So coming back for something like Mars Attacks, having, again, that distinct kind of instrument to... Sure. Well, and and the other thing about Elfman arrangements, and this is going all the way back to Oingo Boingo, Mm -hmm. is he's really good at separating instruments and giving them something that works as a whole, but everyone's not doing. Yeah, Does right. that make sense? Yeah, 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 definitely. And that comes through in Mars Attacks because you have an orchestra, which is a, it's a group of people. It's a massive thing. Sure. Kind of like the cast of the film. Yeah, right. And then you have this one instrument that is singular, but just as powerful sure. as this mass of people, which uh, that would be Jack Nicholson. Sure, just playing a couple of roles yeah. here and there. You know, it's, uh, I think back to Pee Wee that way too, and it's been a while since I listened to that score, so I could just be misremembering it. But I remember that as one of those scores where it's it's very horn-driven. Yeah. It's a lot of that... Uh, Almost circus music. Yeah, it really is. Kind of it's thing. circusy. But it's a lot of those instruments pulling in different directions yeah. and kind of do it like they all showed up to do a job and tried to be their own star. You're still of the talking score. about the cast again. I know. I really am. <laughs> well, okay. So the cast of this movie is uh, about 15 cameos and then Jack Nicholson plays that, all the parts. Yeah, it's, it's bad CG. Jack Nicholson and a million cameos. Well, so who's in this movie? Because I don't recognize any of the faces at all. So I promised, uh, while we're still kind of looming on the subject of music, I promised that I would mention this record I bought. Yes. And then I'll tie that into Annette Benning, and then we can just fly into the cast from there. And I'll make this quick. Annette Benning is she's um the hippie role, right? Uh-huh. She's the uh she's one of Jack Nicholson's characters' wives, the uh the hustling cowboy gambler. Yeah. She's the uh, just quit alcohol, free spirited wife. Sure, and uh, she's all kind of about the world, what the karmic message that the sure. Earth has sent out. Sure. So, in a similar vein, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but I bought the uh, DRC music record. Oh, I thought you were going to say "ain't it un- What does Danny DeVito call it? Ain't oh, it, it ain't unusual. Yeah, that one. Uh, no, I bought the DRC music record, no, no, which no. is that no, Damon Albarn thing. Oh, where, really? Yeah, he he took is this um, new Dan the Automator and a couple other people, and they went down to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, hence DRC. Oh, and sure, yeah, yeah. I they recorded that. a bunch of music with musicians in the Congo and using a bunch of authentic congolese instruments sure and then they programmed it and turned it into awesome digital fucking masterpieces yeah and you can buy it but a hundred percent of the profits go to benefit the congo yep. not 10 percent, not 90 percent. <laughs> sure they see nothing yeah so that's kind of how i wanted to tie that in with annette benning but <laughs> right. she's probably right, the well least done. of the cameos well as done. well uh she's the least of the cameos at least for us on double feature sure. i'm sure there are podmanious listeners who really know Annette Benning? We're not from that zone. We were born in the 80s and we watched movies from the 60s. So anything that happened <laughs> right. in the 90s or 70s, right, right. we're kind of lost on. But there's Michael J. Fox, who we know from, sure. uh, I mean, obviously Back to the Future, but big then one, big one. the massive career he led after sure. that. Uh, there's also Glenn Close. First Lady. Sarah Jessica Parker. Right. Coming back from Ed Wood, where we had our Danny Elfman splits. Uh-huh. Juliet Landau is not coming back. No, she's not back, Wood. unfortunately. Super sad. But we get Pierce Brosnan. That's true. And uh, Pierce Brosnan plays the... Uh, the scientist. Yeah, but the, the compassionate official... scientist. Oh, right. Well, compassionate scientist, I think, is the... Uh... He's the one who... And this is this is the... The brief piece where I really love the message of Mars Attacks before it just becomes straight <laughs> cynicism the whole way through. But we start off giving them the benefit of the doubt. With the, after the bird. It, well, before the bird. Well, even after the bird, Both. I guess. Yeah. Right? Yeah, he's, <laughs> yeah, he's compassionate till the end, really. We go, well, they're an advanced civilization, so they're probably peaceful. Sure. Unlike that, human <laughs> beings who sure. are a Slightly dangerous, warmongering than... species, turns to look at Rod Steiger, right, right. who is uh, the fucking... He wears sunglasses the whole time, Gattle and he's sun. indoors the that whole jerk. time. <gasps> Even when Pierce Brosnan's head is severed, I feel like he would have an appreciation, though, for... I mean, he might not stick up for how peaceful they are anymore. No, but I think but he, he knows why. Yeah. Herbert West why. would definitely have an appreciation yeah. for those experiments. That's true. See, this is what I was talking about, actually. So when we were talking about severed heads uh, back on the Reanimator show, and I was mentioning that sometimes they get really showy and CG. Perfect example. Yeah, it's true. Just a couple short episodes later. <laughs> and uh, here we go. Oh, let's green screen the body. Hey, look, we can make the heads flow. We can yeah. attach them to... 
everybody knows Pierce Brosnan is just kneeling on a pillow and they're green screening <laughs> his body out. And then he has a funny hat on. But yep. the movie pretends that there's some real gravity at play. Right. And that his head is actually attached to this device hanging from the ceiling. Right. Or rolling around on the floor. And he's not just wearing a bunch of blue body paint like he's from Arrested Development. <laughs> well put. Sarah Jessica Parker, on the other hand, they actually severed her head for this role, which is why you never see her in a movie again. Yeah, that's Little exactly Little known uh, trivia case. fact. Other people you never see in movies anymore. <laughs> All of them. Lucas Haas, who okay. plays Richie. Sure. Uh, he's awesome in this movie. Mm-hmm. He's really good at this role. He was in Last Days. Which that's really all we have to say. Last day is interesting. Um, but Lucas Haas has last re- days Schwarzenegger. Last days? No, that's end of days. Yeah, no, I was you're, thinking you're Eraser. St- yeah, stuff. no, I'm thinking Gus Van Sant. Last days. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then wow, well, hold on. Where are we? What bizarro dimension are we in? <laughs> where I'm bringing up the Schwarzenegger action flicks, and you're bringing up the Gus Van Sant death trilogy. I think how uh, is that happening? We're in an alternate reality where Martin Short is still playing roles in film. Oh, that's weird too. Yeah, that's <laughs> another person who vanished. Um, not to mention Lisa Marie, whose career relied solely on her relationship. See, that's with Julia Landau could have played Lisa Absolutely. Marie's role. It could have happened, but it Lisa Marie was happen. fucking Tim Burton at the time. Okay, well that makes sense. So that's how you get into the films, right? Lisa Marie does have that great, um, you know, she she blends in with a lot of the art direction. Oh being yeah, that she is the cover art to this film. Marilyn Monroe. You know, occasionally there's a really inspired piece of kind of lighting and art design. I'm thinking of the one in particular where she's behind the fishbowl. Yeah. And, you know, it's just that light on her face. And, of course, she just poses. Yeah. That's what she does is she stands around and gives off that that glare. And she's obviously the most made-up person Mm -hmm. in the whole film because she's playing the the hyper-stylized humanoid. Right. She's their impression of a human being. Yeah, so she's playing the magazine pinup or the, right. uh, you know, the 50s pop art. Well, and she, I mean, she has an arguably small cameo, uh, but they get smaller. Yeah, right, right. Jack Black is in this movie. Sure. He has maybe... He's gonna go on and save the day, yeah. right? He, he's the he's the kid from the blob, right? He's the hero no, from, from the blob. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, he just gets his ass kicked. He is very, yeah. but I think this is before people knew who the fuck Jack Black was. Well, so this is what I'm talking about, though. They totally set it up as, all right, here's this donut thing. This guy's going to come in <laughs> and he's going to be part of the army that saves the day or something. That doesn't happen no. at all. That does not happen at the slight. Just, he's one of the first fucking casualties. Sure. I think he's one of the, he is the first, I was going to say main character. There are no main characters in well, this movie. The, His role is as big as the extras who are sure. zapped. Christina Applegate also apparently in this film. Oh, yeah, briefly. that's true, too. Mostly yeah. her ass, but also sometimes yeah, her face. I don't think uh, you see her face for more than a minute. <laughs> but that scene where she's outside the Greyhound bus that shows up from yeah. nowhere and goes to nowhere. Yeah. What Greyhound bus picks someone up on the side? In su- a cornfield. Sorry, but as a, as a person who made a trek back and forth to Toronto many a time yeah. in an awful Greyhound bus... You gotta wait in an awful bus depot. You don't get to just hang it's out the on the same, side of the road with your family. It's the same bus that only goes through the Children of the Corn Five Town oh, once every uh, three days. Sure. Same okay. bus. All right. Well, I'm, maybe I wasn't using that line. That's probably what it was. Uh, also, Danny DeVito has uh, he's he's got a role, but it ain't unusual. To okay. See Danny Here's DeVito what I want to know: a Tim Burton film. Just really quick, if you had Danny DeVito at your disposal. Wouldn't you have him do a cover of Ain't It Unusual? It ain't unusual. God, I keep fucking it up. <laughs> it's not a question. Well, you can't fuck it up because it's not the title of the right. song, right? Yeah. As long as I get the title of the actual Tom Jones song yeah. wrong, I am uh-huh. correct. But you have the stage. You have Tom Jones on there. You have the backup singers. <laughs> I would for <laughs> my own- Maybe just during the credits. My own personal collection, I would have Danny DeVito. You know he'd do it. Yeah, he would. He, w- he probably did he it. He probably did do it. I assume he tried to get Tim Burton to film it, and Burton probably wouldn't. They didn't have the time or budget. Yeah. Budgetary constraints. We'll never see that. They would do a duet. I mean- Come on, so many missed opportunities. So we're we're kind of exhausting our uh, our cameo list here. Not true. There's 30 more, but go well, on. Well, but there's two that I'm obviously saving because they are double feature cameos. They're not just film cameos. Oh, really? They are a one Jim Brown. Interesting. Who plays Byron Williams. Great. Heavyweight champion of the world. And his ex-wife. Who plays Coffee and Foxy Brown. Yeah. Uh, yeah that sorry would about be... that show, by the way. I just want to apologize <laughs> for that again. <laughs> That would be Miss Pam Greer. We have two black exploitation stars well, making a cameo that. appearance in a Tim Burton movie. What the fuck? My childhood just collided with my <laughs> adulthood. If you um, 
Okay, so not that I have a vendetta against never seeing that Danny DeVito footage, uh-huh. but I do want to talk about the budget of this film a little okay. bit, because I think when people think back to Mars Attacks and how did they get those celebrities and sure. what the hell was Tim Burton doing sure. and why does Mars Attacks exist and what the fuck is Cronenberg cinematographer <laughs> doing there? Well, the one thing you don't realize, especially when asking your last question there, is how much of Mars Attacks is stock footage. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going back to the Ed Wood thing. I mean, I don't yeah. think we even need to say that, right? right? But there's a lot of that B sci-fi kind of stuff sure. going well, that's, on. Even that's, the idea of an ensemble cast like this not doing anything yeah. is a tactic from B-movies. The film relies on you accepting that it's cheesy. The film relies on and the score forces you to remember. Well, it's weird because I think they tried from a different angle to do the ambitious B-movie thing. Sure. And Warner just shit on their movie. Yeah. It's not that it's just, oh, we're, we're doing an Ed Wood throwback and that's why the movie is what it is. Because we've seen that. That's what Ed Wood was right. as well. It tried to bring a lot of those, you know, Burton's idea there was let's make a lot of these Ed Wood type scenes sure. actually work in modern day. Sure. He didn't just decide to do the opposite here. I think he was still going for the same thing. Warner, on the other hand, thought perhaps it would be more fiscally responsible to do the opposite. So they write up the script, and this was Jonathan Jem's idea. And uh, where did he get this idea? Uh, they're actually, they're trading cards. Mars Attacks Great. is trading card. I believe it. Is it Double Feature's first trading card adaptation? Yeah, until we do one of the magic movies. I was going to say Pokemon the movie, because that's actually a thing. Double Feature. Is it too late for a Herman Cain joke, or can I still make those? Go ahead. I was hoping it would write itself. So yeah, they're trading cards. Mars Attacks is a trading card thing. I I don't know anything. I don't think there's a story. It's similar to Dinosaur's Attack. That's all you need to know. Very similar. Dinosaur's Attack, too similar to Jurassic Park. Mars Attacks, didn't know Independence Day was coming out. Sorry, Mars Attacks. (sighs) So I think this is a lot more Hollywood inspired. It's funny because the cynicism this movie has for Hollywood is... uh, Cynicism this movie has for everything. Well, yeah, it is everything. The government... And Hollywood. Sure, the government. Both get their Hollywood, assholes hippies. Well, I think it's just... big-brained be- aliens. It's because all of the uh, the cameos, I just assume it's making jabs at celebrities right. because of... You know, Las Vegas is somehow the one place you can go outside of Hollywood to still make fun of Hollywood. Sure. Maybe that's because it's or Branson, where, Missouri. It's where uh, Hollywood goes when it dies. And then, yeah, Branson, Missouri is where it gets resurrected. So Jonathan Gems writes up this thing. He's the guy who did, I mean, this guy's got a lot of cutting room floor material, (laughs) but not a lot of successful screenplays. So he writes all these movies that get picked up by studios and then they fire him and get other writers to come in and do these movies. He did uh, Beetlejuice Goes Hawaiian, which is a movie you've never heard of because Uh... it never got made. It's the uh, Beetlejuice sequel that may or may not happen at some point it's in the, the It's the next Beetlejuice sequel that was inspired by the last four minutes of the Beetlejuice movie. Well, I think the, uh, the idea was, hey, wouldn't German expressionism be really funny in a beach movie? So Gems comes up with this idea, and it's his baby, and the studio goes, great, let's fire you and bring in the writers from Ed Wood, because <laughs> that's a good idea. And eventually Gems got back on and wrote the final screenplay and a novelization and all this stuff. Burton's not credited, but I seem to remember him. uh, Maybe he wasn't taking the credit himself, but I think Gems was really talking him up as having written a lot of the stuff that's in here, too. So they start out with this projection. You know, they write up a screenplay and the studio looks at it and goes, oh, yeah, that's a two hundred and fifty million dollar movie. We'll give you 60 million. What can you do with that? (laughs) So, of course, the first thing to go is the stop motion animation. Yeah, just throw that out. Which, I mean, Henry Selleck was busy anyways, right? He's doing uh, James and the Giant Peach at the mm-hmm. time. And after that whole awkward Tim Burton, Danny Elfman nightmare before Christmas thing, it might not be a good idea to pull the bad Selleck memories right. back in. But maybe it would have been a big party. And all that could have <laughs> been, we'll never know. I'm trying to imagine. This movie's hard enough to imagine in its present form it's true. with the uh, CGI. If so it it's hard to imagine filmed, stop motion. If it weren't filmed and out for public consumption i wouldn't believe that it existed well it's a weird kind of usually cg looks passable most people you and i bitch about it okay most people accept it yeah and in the years past uh you know it i was gonna say the years past it's prime but it never really has a prime it just ages poorly very rapidly this cg started so poorly that it aged like a cartoon does yeah where you watch it now 
and you can't possibly think they ever thought this would integrate with reality. Right. Yeah. It, it was always Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Sure. Uh, but it, it probably wasn't. I mean, I remember seeing this movie in a theater. It came out, and I don't rem- You know, Tim Burton wasn't standing there going, hey, you're supposed to believe there's aliens yeah. interacting with people. But they do it in such a way where I could see where they would have tried to. And it, it's the type of thing they might have gone stop motion for a little more realism. Mm-hmm. Burton always wanted it to be outlandish and ridiculous but uh, i think you're supposed to believe that they're actually there yeah it's very painted on cartoon yep i remember when i first saw it i don't think i even realized it was cg but (laughs) i was too fucking scared sure when i saw it the first time well they're skull faces they have skull faces with big brains and they just they're mean and i just couldn't get my head around why they were so fucking evil well and i love the idea too that what if aliens appear and they're just not marketable. Yeah. What if they're just too, you know, everybody sees the aliens for the first time. They're all excited. Ooh, Martians. They flip on their TV and exhaustively humankind all goes, oh, they look like yeah. that. Yeah. It's the audience's response. Sure. They showed up for Independence Day and they thought, oh, this isn't a Ridley Scott film. Yeah. Which is also what audiences who showed up to Independence Day thought. Sure. But maybe in a slightly different way. There's just no realism, and they look uh, terrible. They have skulls, and they look very mean. They're and they bark. They, they have the bark. backwards quack. They have a weird. They have a weird Germanic language. Well, of that course, it just it. They sound angry no matter what they're saying. I love that about them. Yeah, right. I love that. We Are you saying in... all Germans sound angry no matter what? They're yeah, saying? I am. I am saying that. Yeah, German probably isn't what linguists would consider one of the romantic languages. Not quite. Nor Martian, so it's obviously very abrasive from the get-go, and then, you know, we just start laser zapping people. Blow up Congress. A left and a right. Before we get out of here, I wanted to ask you about something. Okay. Now, you don't do a lot of acting yourself. I don't do, you do oh, a lot God. of uh, a lot of guitaring. I do a lot of guitaring. Um, I don't do any acting myself. I know nothing about it. But between the two of us right now, you would be the acting champion, I think. Yeah. Sure. Um, you did a monologue one time. I did. I, I did one audition in my entire life. Now, if I remember correctly, that is the uh, the monologue. It's a Jack Nicholson monologue. Yeah. Uh, from Mars Attacks. It was, in fact. Yes. It's awesome. The, uh, it's the presidential monologue when he's talking to the, the alien ambassador. And he said... Uh, oh, does, the Shed a Tear yeah, uh, monologue. Right. Excellent. The, uh, the why can't we all just get along <laughs> right monologue and that was the only i this, didn't get the part by the way oh well, turns that's out good. what what i didn't know uh is that you're not supposed to do monologues that you see in films because oh. uh you're supposed to read them and make them your own oh but instead that. i just kind of used a lot of what jack nicholson did sure and because i thought it was brilliant you should have gone for his uh presidential uh monologue from the uh the tv batman Oh, sorry. Yeah, from Batman. I wish they would have re- just reused that. <laughs> so here's what I'd like, because this doesn't exist on the internet. Some sort of side-by-side or shot-for-shot shot or YouTube mashup comparison of the presidential address from Mars Attacks on the TV with the Joker address on TV, because I always want to say it's reused, it's the same thing, or it's calling back to it, or it's a joke. I can't find it anywhere side by side. And Well, it's because there's other Batman movies that have clouded the search engine optimization. It's true. It's absolutely true. That's precisely what's happened. Uh, so if somebody find that, we'll put it on our website, and then you can Google it, and it'll show up. Wow. It would be really funny if it were just... It's not just reused, because it's specific to the movie. But it would be really funny if they save budget by just pulling that scene <laughs> out of Batman and planting it in here, which is basically what they ended up doing anyways. My name is Eric. I'm here with Michael, and you've reached the end of Double Feature. This is the best 12 seconds of this chapter, by the way. At least the end it of It doesn't this, get better than this. This episode of Double Feature. We have a website and an email address, uh, doublefeatureshow.com, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com a Facebook, and you can go on iTunes and leave us a review. We're basically on the fucking internet. So we're doing two more movies uh, next time. Yeah, we're going to do a pair of documentaries that have questionable integrity. Okay. (laughs) The Last Exorcism and Exit Through the Gift Shop. Oh, good. Back to horror. Glad we got that one week. Yeah, Exit's Uh, really scary. So uh, watch more fucking film. And goodbye.